Hello, this is Jim Schaefer, executive producer and host of Rip Rap, the academic book television program. My guest today is Lonnie Guineer, the author of The Miner's Canary, Enlisting Race, Resisting Power, Transforming Democracy. Welcome to Rip Rap, Lonnie. Thank you. This is a powerful book. As we were talking about, I've got all about half the book uh, pages are dog-eared. And uh, before we start talking about the book, though, you have quite an interesting story about how you began the collaboration with Gerald Torres, your co-author, and I thought maybe it would be interesting to have you tell how that happened. Well, I was preparing to respond to an argument that David Plotke, a political scientist, was making that race is the a category that shouldn't be emphasized for those who are interested in progressive social change. And Plotky had apparently taken a picture of me to graduate students that he was teaching in Hungary. And he showed them my picture and he asked them to identify my ethnicity. And they said, well, she may be North African, but is probably Italian. And so he used that as evidence that the focus on race in the United States was um, really out of whack with the role that race plays and therefore we should have race neutral policies and everything should be colorblind even for progressives. And very soon after I read Plotky's article I was in a parking lot in Philadelphia and a black attendant saw me from a distance of about a hundred feet and he looked at me and he was so excited to see me because he recognized me and he said, oh, I know who you are. You're the person that Clinton tried to appoint to his cabinet. And he just was going on and on. And then he said, I know why you didn't get that job. You were too black. You were too black. And so here was the same person in Hungary, North Italian, and in Philadelphia, too black. And it suggested, and I started to talk to Gerald about the process of um, trying to respond to this, that we really needed to come up with a different way of thinking about race because race was not just skin color. It, there was a political dimension to race that had been underappreciated. Well, you talk quite a bit in the book about colorblind and how that's really not an effective uh, tool for looking at race. Maybe we can talk a little bit more about that because this is really kind of a wonderful point. And you know, it's, people think it's politically correct if they say, "Well, that's just not an issue." Well, we uh, I, we both start with personal stories, and I tell the story of my son Nicholas when he was eight years old, looking over my shoulder as I was typing on a computer, and I had written, "A well-dressed black woman came up and wanted to take a picture with me." And she thought that if she had a picture with me, she was from Texas, that she would display this picture in her office and then nobody would mess with her. And so I was typing this on the computer and Nico looking over my shoulder said, Mom, take out the word, word black. I said, why? He said, well, it doesn't matter. He was attending a Quaker school at the time and they were teaching him that race was irrelevant. So I said, well, okay, if I take out the word black, should I also take out the word woman? and just say a well-dressed person. And he said, oh, no, oh, no, you have to leave in the word woman. I said, why? He said, well, because there's sexual abuse. He said, let me show you. So we were at home. He goes into his room, and he says, okay, Mom, now pretend that I'm walking down the street. If I were to approach you and to touch you in a way that um, was inappropriate, that would be wrong, and that would be sexual abuse. So I said, okay, now let's walk down the same street, although this time I'm walking and you're standing there, and what if I were to come past you and look at you and say, you ugly nigger? And he jumped back and he said, Mom, you just called me the N-word. He said, is anybody going to call me that? And I said, reluctantly, yes, it's quite possible. And he said, Mom, you just made me wish that I was white. I said, why? He said, because if I were white, nobody would call me that. And it made me realize, just in terms of my own son, that his education about colorblindness was, number one, not preparing him to live in the real world, world. but number two, that there were aspects of race in terms of um, the assets of race, not just the stigma, that he was not being taught. So it really seemed important 
to think about race, not just as stigma, which is what was scaring him, but also to present the ways in which race can be a diagnostic tool, it can be a way of uh, mobilizing people against injustice, and it can become a vision of a just society in which people of color may have a particular insight about systemic injustice that they can then share with others. This is what uh, Martin Luther King used to say, that agitation around race, agitation around civil rights was a gift that people of color gave to whites. And that's the origin of the metaphor, the miner's canary, that people of color can be the canary in the mines who alert the miners because problems converge around the canary. The canary has a more fragile respiratory system, and that signals to the miners that the atmosphere in the mines, if something happens to the canary, there's a problem that's going to ultimately affect them as well. And that's our argument, that what's happening to people of color is going to happen to all of us, and that we need to heed the signal of the canary. Well, one of the things I noticed in the book is that you specific, it, it, you kept resisting the thing to go into abstractions, you know, like the thing about the, you know, colorblind being really impossible. We all have colors. But you, you kept pressing the issue of specific circumstances, specific people, specific ethnic backgrounds, and then even within a specific ethnic background, the variations that would happen with that. And so I thought that gives this diagnostic tool of looking at race in a political context and social context and all the different ways, more traction. I thought that was really interesting and helpful. Well, part of what we try to argue is that race has potential to help everyone see problems that are systemic, that are um, affecting structures, not just individuals. That the problem with colorblindness, or one of the problems, is that it assumes that race is just an individual personal problem, and that if you as an individual ignore race, then you are making a contribution to the eradication of racism or of racial injustice, when in fact, oftentimes it's by tracking race that you can do more to eradicate racial injustice. And so the example we give there is the Texas 10% plan, where when affirmative action was eliminated in Texas as a result of a lawsuit, a group of black and Latino professors and advocates and activists got together and started to look for alternative ways that students could be admitted to one of the two flagship public institutions, University of Texas in Austin or Texas A&M. And they discovered that the use of SATs, which was a primary mechanism for getting into the school, was not only disadvantaging students of color, blacks and Latinos, but it was also disadvantaging working class and poor whites. And they did research and found that using the SAT, out of the 1,500 high schools throughout Texas, that only 150 of those 1,500 high schools were providing 75% of the freshman class at the University of Texas, Austin. 10% of the high schools were filling 75% of the freshman class, and that there was this class bias because those 10% of the high schools were from suburban Austin and suburban Houston and suburban uh, Dallas, or they were private schools, and that in fact, if you tracked what was happening to students of color, you could begin to see what was also happening to working class and poor whites, but it was visible when it converged around the canary. It was less visible when it was affecting poor and working class whites. So they came up with this plan called the Texas 10% plan that anybody in the top 10% of their graduating class throughout the state would automatically be eligible for admission to one of the two flagship schools. And they submitted this to the legislature and it passed by one vote. And the one vote came from a conservative Republican legislator who represented a rural West Texas county. And he voted for the 10% plan because he realized that not a single one of his constituents, who were primarily white, working class, and poor um, residents, not a single one had gone to the University of Texas in the past 10 or 15 years. So that what was disadvantaging blacks was also disadvantaging his constituents. 
The, and there's other studies that you talk about, like at the University of Michigan, and you have done work at Harvard, too, in trying to understand how the, the process of admission and then how people were, you know, doing after they were admitted. Right. That when the admission process focuses simply on trying to come up with this objective, so-called neutral proxy for merit, which I, I call the testocracy, right? <laughs> it's, it's this emphasis on quick strategic guessing with less than perfect information, <laughs> a test that um, students can be coached to do well on, and that practicing taking it can improve your scores, that th even those students who did really well on that test didn't necessarily fulfill the mission of the school that had focused on the test when it first admitted them. So they may do OK first year in college or first year in law school. But University of Michigan had three measures of success for people who graduated from the school, not just people who attended it, that they did well financially, that they enjoyed their career, and that they were leaders in their community, that they became members of the bar who were giving back to the taxpayers who had after all, subsidized their education. University of Michigan is a public institution. They found that those with the highest index scores coming into the law school, with the highest LSAT and um, undergraduate GPA, were no more likely to be financially well off. Everybody who went to the University of Michigan and graduated from the law school basically did well financially. There was a modest relationship between high incoming index scores and career dissatisfaction and there was a negative relationship between these high index scores and leadership in the community. That is, the higher your LSAT, the less likely you were to mentor younger attorneys, to serve on community boards, or to do pro bono work. And it was the students of color who had come in through affirmative action who ultimately fulfilled the mission of the school in all three dimensions. They did well financially, they enjoyed their career, and they became leaders in the community. That word, uh, the word you use, community, was the one that, as, as I was reading the book, kept popping up in my mind because I was thinking, there, and you also use periphery and core. And so it seems as though what you're talking about is, uh, w first of all, is the community relationship among the individuals in the society, that it's an I thou kind of thing. It's a showing respect and consideration for everyone without a bias mm -hmm. to it. But there's also moving from the periphery to the core and being more fair, I guess you say. Or, but then you also have quite a few thoughts about how to, I don't want to say force the issue, but to press the issue fairly aggressively, I guess. Well, there are many ideas in this book. You're absolutely right. And one of the ideas is that we don't have all the answers. And so part of our goal is to provoke people into thinking outside of the box because it is that process of challenging deeply held and fundamental assumptions that can lead to innovative ways of solving complex problems. And one of the arguments we make, which is a consistent theme throughout the book, is that moving from the margin where people of color or women or the disabled, people who've been left out or underrepresented, that Studying what's happened to them can enable us to understand not just what's happened to them, but what's happened at the settled core of practices that institutions are committed to. So that's the example, what I call confirmative action, moving from the experience of affirmative action, which has led to the admission of these black and Latino students at the University of Michigan who are outperforming their white colleagues in terms of the actual mission of the school. And confirming what the school was doing right in terms of admitting them and using that lesson to then begin to rethink how they're admitting everybody. And one of the important moves from the margin to the core is to challenge this over-reliance on standardized aptitude tests, which have a very modest, very modest relationship to first-year college grades or first-year law school grades, have a stronger relationship to parental income within each race and ethnic group as your family income goes up, so do your test scores, and even have a relationship to grandparents' socioeconomic status, and to begin to question why schools are so committed to these tests that aren't really telling them who's going to do well even first year, except a, in, a, in a small um, 
group of, you know, between 15 and 20 percent vary in, s in first year grades. The SAT relates to a very small percentage and are actually misdiagnosing those people who are going to do well as citizens in the democracy. And part of it, I would argue, is that the tests socialize some students into believing that when they do well on these tests, that they have somehow earned a right to pursue their own ambitions without regard to the consequences to the rest of the community. And so there's a sense in which the tests reinforce a set of values that the school is actually not standing behind. And so there's a disconnect between the value of commitment to community and the emphasis on these standardized, um, timed tests that are teaching students how to guess, not how to think. Well, and you make an important point about the, the research of, of what was it, Uri uh, Wiseman? Oh, Uri Treisman, yeah. Yeah, about the prompts. Well, and you make an important point about the, the research of, of what was it, Uri uh, Wiseman? Oh, Uri Treisman, yeah. Yeah, about the prompts. Uh, and the, the oh no, Claude Steele, the the um, stereotype. Yeah, the well, the the th the prompt where you say, uh, "This is not a yeah, this is not a big test," and then they would do better. Mm -hmm. And if you told them this is the test to determine whether or not you go on, then there was yeah. right that some students don't do well on these tests because they have internalized what they perceive to be negative expectations about their performance in intellectual domains, and so. Claude Steele, who is now at Stanford but was at the University of Michigan for a um, while and did some of this research at the University of Michigan, found that if he tells high-performing black students right before they take one of these GREs or um, aptitude tests, this is a test of your intellectual aptitude to pursue a particular um, career, then their scores plummet compared to uh, white students who are taking the same test with the same prompt. But if he tells those students, this test is just a, uh, an irrelevant precondition before we can get on to the meat of the experiment, then they do the same as the white students. And his conclusion is that when you give people a prompt that makes them anxious about their performance on a, an aptitude test where guessing is actually a way to do well, that it causes these students to choke. And so instead of proceeding quickly through the test, they start to study and um, rethink some of their answers. And then that slows them down, and they don't perform as well. But he also shows that this problem does not just affect students of color. And he does the same uh, experiment with white male students who think of themselves as high achieving math students. And he gives them a difficult math test, and he says, this is a test of how well white male students do on math compared to Asian male students. And the white male students' scores go down compared to the Asian male students. Again, because when you give people prompts that cause them to question their capacity, it may also affect their ability to do well on this kind of test. And that's an example of, as you say in the book, of following the canary. In other words, asking the question, not what's the symptom, but what's a way to fix the root cause. Right. What they call in sociology, I think, upstreaming the problem, right? <laughs> you see all these dead fish in the stream, and you don't just count the dead fish. You have to figure out who may be polluting the stream or who may be putting something in the water that is causing the problem in the first place. I thought that metaphor of the canary in, in your talk the other night, you used that extensively, but it also in the book, it, it really does help us to understand, and again, in a sense of community, if there's something like that happening with you know, someone who's more affected by something, then we have to ask what's causing it, what does that mean, and then what r really be a way to respond to it. And also then to begin to see the canary as an integral part of our community instead of something that's excluded or shunned or... Or know. peripheral. <laughs> right. The other thing, concept, was the idea of resisting power. And I think it's really more than that, but you've got the chapter on enlisting race to resist a uh, hierarchy. Um, but it really entails a whole examination of power and what it is. Well, part of our premise of um, the Minus Canary is that this is not just a, a, a piece of advocacy for traditional civil rights remedies. This is really challenging both 
those on the right and those on the left, who have focused on individual solutions to systemic problems. So we're questioning whether it's enough to repopulate hierarchies in which power is zero sum and in which whoever wins gets all the power. And so there's a great emphasis on simply winning without regard to what the consequences may be of your victory to the losers. And as a result, even solutions that liberals, women's groups or civil rights groups have uh, tended to endorse had a role at one point but may need to be rethought now. And that is the solution of um, what one of my colleagues calls robust tokenism, right? That if you just <laughs> had a black person running this show, if you just had a woman of color in charge, that that would solve the problem because they would bring a different perception or a different consciousness to a set of problems. And there is some evidence that people who have been outside a system come in and may be more willing to question it, at least initially. But without systems of accountability, then the institution and its hierarchy often socialize those individuals much more than what their initial conscience, conscience or their initial set of um, aspirations or ideals may be able to withstand. So we're saying that it's not just about changing how we think about race. It's not just moving from the view that race is a noun to race is a verb, right? We're trying to say race is very dynamic, and it's not just a status. It's not just who you are or what you call yourself. It's what you do, how you act. But it's also about using race to challenge conventional ideas of power, that it's not just how you can improve things for yourself, but how you can change things to benefit a larger community. And so we talk at some length in the context of redistricting and in the context yeah. of politics, how it's not enough just to get blacks elected to a legislature using these gerrymandered districts when the, it, the real problem is districting and how it gives too much power to the incumbents, whatever their race, and not enough choice to the voters. And you discuss alternate concepts like majority, minority um, uh, redistricting and taking a look at that. And, and you have some pretty uh, uh, distinct comments to make about the, the Supreme Court's position. <laughs> <laughs> distinct? Yes, distinct. you're very polite. <laughs> More polite than I am, probably. Distinct. <laughs> but it, it's, it was interesting that you, s you spend a fairly extensive amount of time looking at the political interaction and the political system. And, and you have that phrase running through the book, a political race project. Maybe talk a little bit. Of well, in terms of a political race project, we see this as an exciting opportunity, an opening, to question assumptions about what is race, what is power, and what is democracy, and use all of that to envision something that is not just going to benefit people of color, it's not just going to benefit women, it's not just going to benefit outsiders, but it's also going to benefit all Americans. That this is really about changing our assumptions that when, for example, we call ourselves a democracy, that we are committed not just to electing natural leaders of a society, but we are committed to involving all of the voters in the process of collective decision making and in making the decisions that affect their lives. And that requires much more profound rethinking about things like winner-take-all single-member districts, which is the way in which we elect members of Congress, members of state legislatures, but it's not mandated by the Constitution, and it is not in fact used by most other democracies which have much higher levels of voter turnout and voter participation. And we keep thinking, oh, the problem is you know, the various candidates and negative campaigning, when the problem is a much more structural problem that requires candidates to try to move to the center in order to gain as many votes as possible while also demobilizing voters who would vote either for their opponent or voters who um, they're not sure how they would vote. And so there's a relationship between winner-take-all districting and low voter participation that needs to be explored if we really are committed to involving more people in the process of democracy. And that's a relationship that you can see if you watch the canary. And that's what we're saying. People, the Supreme Court, for example, is very critical of race-conscious districting and says, 
Well, the problem with race conscious district and when you draw districts in order to protect minority voters is that you're sending the wrong message to the person who gets elected that their only responsibility is to those voters who voted for them. And yet, that's a problem not just with districts that are drawn around race, that's a problem with all districts because who's drawing the districts after all, right? Most often not the court but the incumbent politicians who are in fact drawing districts to find voters who are going to support them because that's who they think they are primarily accountable to. And those people who end up being in the minority in a particular district are just losers. They are permanent losers. They don't have a chance to change who is representing them except if they move. Well, and it's important, I think, to, to also say that this book is, extends into class and gender as you're looking at all of these issues, and that's really a, an important aspect of it. Right. It's, it, again, the losers in a winner-take-all system could be Republicans in a Democratic district. They could be women in um, a district. They could be union members. I mean, it depends who's drawing the district, and that person is going to privilege their supporters and permanently disadvantage those people that don't support them so that we hold elections in November, but in fact the real election has already taken place once every 10 years. For Congress, we hold elections every two years. The election has already taken place when the districts are drawn, and if you look at the districts between 1990 and 2000, there were only a handful which changed hands back and forth more than once in the entire 10-year period. So once an incumbent gets elected, in the first cycle, they're basically in there until the next redistricting. So we think we have elections every two years, when in fact we have elections only every 10 years, and the only people who are voting in our elections every 10 years are the incumbent politicians. Who draw the district. <laughs> right. That's how they vote. They vote by drawing themselves a nice district. At the end of your book, you say that you want to shift the focus from that of groups like the Civil Rights Movement and how far we've come to where we're going and to reclaim race in order to complete democracy, and that's really an important point. Again, it's not only about building community, but the premise behind democracy is that there is a community where the people are able to articulate and participate. And that there's a vision of justice, not just a complaint about injustice. And so this is an optimistic book that's saying we need to articulate what that vision of justice looks like and not just identify the ways in which various people have been um, victimized or disadvantaged, which is obviously important and we're not saying you should ignore people who have been disadvantaged, but to use that disadvantage as a way of helping you to articulate a new vision, not just complaining about what is happening. You said at the very last sentence, our belief that what is real is in part a function of what we allow ourselves to dream. Right. Thank you for being on Rip Rap. Thank you. Mm -hmm.